Um, so hi everyone, I'm Chaba Hoch and this is Victoria Ferdes. We are from Erlang Solutions and we are going to talk about tools in Erlang for production systems. Um, how many of you use Erlang here? Yeah? How many of you have put a bug into an Erlang system that went into production? Some of you. Oh, okay. no, be honest, be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there were quite a few hands. So I think that it's useful if we have tools with which we can go into production systems and uh, see what's going on inside the system. And in general, Erlang is, is very good at this. So in the first part of my talk, I will, or our talk, uh, I will give a brief overview of what kinds of tools we have. And then I will show you that we did an integrated uh, let's say, framework, um, so that you can write your own tools that fit into this framework and do the same th thing as these uh, other tools. Okay, Chavo, but why do I need tools? So, I mean, why it, this is just an Erlang code, so... Hmm? Yeah, so the first approach is actually that you just get into the production Erlang node and start typing code, right? So, if I'm interested in, uh, let's say, information about the process, then I can say that I want to see what the init process is doing, so I'm writing it as a list, converting it to a PID, and ask Erlang process info to tell me some information about the process. I can even pass some additional parameters like current stack trace so that I can get even more information about these processes. I even have shortcuts in the shell documented in the module called C, so that I just need to say I000 and I will get a bunch of information about the init process. So this is very flexible and convenient in some sense, because you can do whatever you want, but it was also very dangerous. Let's see an example. So let's say that I have a process, um, and that process has a large message queue, and I want to see what's inside that message queue. So let's say that one message is 10 kilobyte long. Here I'm creating such a message. And let's say that the message queue has 5,000 elements. So this is the message queue. And what I do is that uh, I get this message queue and I ask IO lib format to convert this into a string. It shouldn't be too large. Yeah, it's not a nice thing to do, but it should be like 50 megabytes or something like that. And I have many gigabytes in my machine. But if I do this, then this will happen. So this is a graph that shows the, the total memory usage of this node. The red row is when I release this command. And in 30 seconds, the memory usage of the node went up to 5 gigabytes. And this is because the pretty printer wants to do a good job, but it takes quite a few resources, notably memory, to uh, in this message queue in a pretty way. So writing code is like a chef's knife. It's very flexible. You don't need anything special. But it's tedious to use it all the time, like you have to write the code or copy-paste it from somewhere. Um, you need expertise to use it. There are many Erlang systems that are operated by people who are not Erlang developers. So this whole Erlang syntax and shell and typing those commands is alien to them. And it's also very dangerous. Yeah, and actually I want to be the hero of the day and not the one who killed the managed node. So what I can do, Chavo? Yeah, I will tell you in a second. Okay. <laughs> so there are other tools that you can use in that case. So on the other end of the scale, there are tools which are good at doing one thing, and do that one thing safely. So for example, ETOP. If you get into an Erlang node, you can ask ETOP to list you um, the top Erlang processes by some criterion, for example, message queue length, and you will get this information in a safe way. Another example is the addsi function, which will tell you what adds tables you have on your node, and what are the attributes of these tables. You can even pass the name of a table to this function, and then you will get the contents of the table, and you will get it in chunks. So 
so that the system is not overloaded. So these tools are like these kitchen appliances. You don't need anything extra. Again, you can do one thing and you can do it safely. But that also means that the capabilities of these tools are quite limited. Well, actually, I'm looking for something more universal. So uh, what I can use in most cases, and, and it maybe looks fancier. Yeah, I have something more fancy for you, and this is called Observer. So Observer is a graphical tool. It's like this uh, glass ball. It's uh, fancy, nice, and versatile, but it's also very fragile. So this is how it looks like. Um, you get some basic system information with it, you get uh, resource utilization, you get processes drawn into nice trees, you can click on them to get more information, you get ETOP-like process listing, um, you can get information about the nets, about the ads and NISIA tables, and even some tracing uh, information. So it's intuitive to use, like most graphical tools. That's its main advantage, and it's very convenient. You just start it and click around. You don't have to read a manual to find out how it works. But the biggest problem with it is that it requires the WX graphical library. And often, when you have like a Linux server running your Erlang code, um, you don't have any graphical libraries installed. So you can just go in and start Observer. Sometimes what you can do is you have your own Erlang node on your laptop, let's say, and if you can connect from that node to the production node via Erlang distribution, then you can start Observer locally and ask it to get the information from that other node. But usually that's not a good solution either because you have firewall rules and security rules that protect the production node from being connected to just from a, a developer laptop. And, and actually, if there is an ongoing outage, that I'm under stress. So I want something that will definitely work, and I don't want to bother myself with uh, firewall rules and anything. OK. So let's look at tools then that are outside of Erlang. So, so far, we have explored what's included in the Erlang distribution. Let's see what else is out there. There is Ntop, which is similar to Etop, but you don't have to actually connect to the Erlang node. You just start a, simil uh, a separate Erlang node, tell it the, the node ID of your Erlang node, and you can get nice information. You can get uh, keyboard shortcuts to decide where you want to sort, and things like that. Another very useful tool is Redbug. It's different from the ones that I have been uh, talking about previously, so uh, let me tell you the, the logic. So Redbug is like a blender. It takes something, like Erlang tracing, which is very dangerous, and tries to make it as safe as possible. So Erlang tracing is dangerous because a function can be called many times, and if it's called very often with huge arguments, then you can overload the system very easily by tracing. So what Redbug has, is that you can specify, like in this example, I say that I'm interested in calls towards the list member function, but if I have 10 messages that I have collected, or mm, one minute elapsed from the time when I started to the collection, then I want to stop the collection and stop the tracing, whichever happens first. Um, and then you can see an example of a printout, so at this time, yeah, you don't see the pointer. So uh, at this time, uh, this process, which was started this way, um, had the list member function called with this list as a parameter list. So Redbug is very, very useful, but you have to be careful with this as well. Redbug is also dangerous. So let's say that I have a gen server, which has a handle call function, which of course gets a state as a parameter. And I'm interested in uh, calls towards this handle call function. So what I say to Redbug is that I'm interested in this function. Uh, 100 messages are enough for me. That's a low enough number to sound safe. And again, a one minute uh, interval. And I want to print the output into the file so that I don't get like this much information in the terminal. And I create, again, a 10 kilobyte binary, which will be my uh, example. 
and create a, a state or a simulated state with 500 of these binaries. And when I call this uh, handle core function 100 times, then I get something quite similar to what I have shown before. Um, in 20 seconds, the memory usage of my node will go up to 5 gigabytes. And that's because Redbug is quite fast in collecting uh, all that function calls and passing uh, these huge states towards the file server all the time. But then the file server is not quick enough to write out all this information in a pretty printed form. Um, there are two other tools that I would like to mention briefly. One is Recon, which also does tracing in a safe way. Um, and it gives you some uh, other tools to get information safely about processes. And it has also some completely different things, um, like dealing with uh, beam allocators and memory fragmentation. And finally, I'd like to mention Early Burly, which is uh, also best in tracing. It has a nice graphical interface, actually. Um, and there will be a talk in the next slot about Early Burly. Um, and the reason that it is a, not a blender but an immersion blender is that it's not as safe as Recon as Redbug because it doesn't have overload protection. So it's actually not recommended to use it for production nodes, only in development. So this is what I have been talking about so far. There is a developer, there is an Erlang node, and the developer is talking to the Erlang node uh, via these tools. Yeah, but uh, what if we think that uh, maybe there is an another approach to <laughs> to to tackle this problem? So I mean, there will be outages. You will need to be investigated, but it would be nice if you do not need to to uh, run tools on the managed node. It would be nice if you would be able to, to use your existing operation maintenance infrastructure to, to retrieve this information or to, to execute nodes. And actually, I, I would say that we have such a tool. This is called Bombato AM. This is an operational maintenance tool for Erlang and Elixir nodes and for whatever exotic implementations that are running on the Beam virtual machine. So, uh, Wombat OEM was primarily designed for uh, preemptive support. That means that agents that are started on the managed node are collecting metrics, notifications, and alarms. Uh, but what if we could ask these agents to help us in tooling? It would be much more uh, comfortable and hopefully more safer to use. Yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. So I'd like you to add all of these tools, actually, uh, to this Wombat. Well, but uh, yeah, as, as you thought, these have uh, different dependencies, and their aims are different, <laughs> the requirements, <laughs> and the, what they produce. So I mean, the results, these are totally different. Yeah, but I, I'm sure you can solve all these problems. And yeah, I want, I want all of these tools, really. And I want even these tools. <gasps> and this tool, and this tool, which is, is very useful, by the way. I, I want one of these. And this is my favorite tool that I want you to add to Wombat. OK, Chava, so your favorite tool is so custom that, that I think uh, you should implement it yourself. So I mean, what if I give you an open API, and you will implement this functionality? I think I can live with that. That's OK. <laughs> so then I think if I want to add all these tools, then I will return result in a chaos, right? And how can I avoid chaos? Well, with, uh, with a very smart, easily extendable, and extremely general architecture that has an open API, that allows Chaba to implement his uh, favorite tool. So now the question is, or the challenge, is how to design such general architecture, right? And, and I maybe uh, start with finding the common points. So 
So to get the um, very broad picture, uh, let's analyze the problem. The, the first question can be that when we want to start these tools, so actually these tools are running only for a short period of time when there is an outage or when we want to analyze and investigate our system. And where we start these tools? Well, on the managed node that behaves crazy. And what we really want uh, to retrieve information or to execute some comments on the managed node. And how can we do this? Well, actually, uh, that's a good question, but wait a minute. So what we really want to do is to retrieve information or to, to introduce some changes. And, and why, right? Why, why we are doing this stuff? And, and the question and the answer is to recover from outages or to further analyze our system and to, to find bottlenecks and eliminate the weakest points. And how can we uh, really do this? So what will we really do on the managed node? And, and, and these are nest details, right? So if I want to change a configuration parameter on a node, then, then how I will change it, it definitely depends on the configuration tool that I use. So if I uh, using Erlang OTP standards, then I will change the configuration parameter in the configuration file, I mean in the sysconfig file. But if I'm using cuttlefish config, then then I will need to change the cuttlefish configuration and then generate the sysconfig file. And how do you want to implement all this? <sighs> yeah, so we are living in the long world. So I think I trust Joe. <laughs> and I want to make everything asynchronous. I want to prepare for failures. And, and I want to allow to terminate requests. So now we know the model, we know what our goal is. So now let's further an analyze the problem. So go into details. Maybe it's a good idea to choose a limited set of tools and try to still find the common points. But yeah, so what ETOP returns? It will return um, a list of, uh, of process informations. Uh, what soft purges do, is, is to get uh, rid of all the old version of the modules. This is uh, used for its uh, side effect, while uh, retrieving a process trait state or tracing a process is, is a thing that we can only do when we know which process to be traced or which process to be inspected. So here uh, we need to know uh, the process identifier, so we need to have a context. And not mentioning changing configs, so uh, I need to know the, the, um, the name of the application, the name of the key, and, and what change config returns, the, well, this actually returns a very, very meaningful OK at home. Thank you. Yeah, so the thing is that I have to admit that this whole thing sounds very scary. <laughs> Implementing a, a tool that can respect all these different uh, requirements of all, of all these smaller tools. Yeah, maybe, but if we step back and, and observe that actually all of these uh, features or services are just, just something that we execute and, and and yeah, they need input to, 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 perf to do their job, and they will use this input to produce the output. That's true. So all of them have input and produce some output. But the very important point here is that the execution framework do not need to understand it, right? It's, it's just need to allow uh, the implementation of the service to specify its interface. So then the users or someone else can request for this service. And, 
and the framework should have the ability to to collect the output of the service and then uh, forward it to the user. And let's say that's it. So now I'm able to to uh, tell you Chaba what you need to implement to to realize your favorite tool. So the only thing you need to implement is three callbacks. And the first one is the init request. So what when you are initializing a request, you you should uh, check the input, you should validate the input, you should ask yourself, uh, do I know everything to perform this request? Or can I do this? Am I up for this job? Right? This is very important. And, and if you have received uh, incorrect data, then you should deny the execution. But if you believe that uh, this is out of scope of your duty, so I mean, you are you implementing a service that is able only to change MongoSIAM configurations, and you were asked to change, let's say, Mnesia configuration, then you will say that this is not your job, so you will return out of scope. But if you think everything is correct and given, you will accept this request. When you accept this request, you should return information that, uh, that will uh, tell the execution framework how would you like to execute really this request. But you do nothing here. Just, just, pass, just give some further information about the execution. Yeah, uh, and then, there will be the time when you really need to do your job, so you need to execute the request. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. And you should only do um, one unit of the task. And, and the execution can result in, in, in termination. So you can say that you, you, you done, right? You finished what you have to done. Or, or, or you can tell that you will continue. You can return data if there is meaningful data, or, or you tell us that you don't want to return data. And, and if you failed, then you should admit your failure and give some explanation. Yeah. Afterward, when the request terminated, then you can, you can clean up the mess after yourself. So this is the, the cleanup request duty. And there you can, um, so for instance, if in the init request you allocated resources, then you should release these resources in the cleanup request. Okay, so this is what you need to implement, right? I think this is a, this is a reasonable task, so it's not a big effort. And, and so now let's see what, what we do at Wombat side, so let's see the uh, architecture. So here you can see <laughs> the user and the Wombat node. So as, uh, as said, plugins uh, can, can change their minds so they can think that they are no longer able to provide the service. And, uh, and you can add your plugin or anyone can add their new plugins. Those are considering that uh, you are allowed to overwrite uh, our default implementations. So uh, all of them implies that the list of available services will vary among the Erlang nodes. That means that we need a service catalog. This service catalog will be maintained by the service locator process and you should Imagine this service catalog as, uh, as a database that you can browse. And based on the uh, information retrieved from the service catalog, you can initiate requests. Initiating requests is handled uh, primarily by the request manager process. So this process accepts requests and, and maintains its 
not a database, which is the so-called request catalog. Users are able to browse the request catalog and so they can see which requests are running at the moment. So uh, there is a user, there is a Wombat, but there, are, there is no managed node, so it's, it's a bit of boring. So let's add the Erlang node or an Elixir node or an LFE node or, yeah. So in this Erlang node, there are two implementations that both of them implement the, configura uh, the configuration services. But the first one implements a specific configuration, so it's only able to work with Mongoose IAM uh, configurations. And the second one is the general configura configurator plugin. Okay, so when these plugins have uh, been started on the managed node, they will announce their services to the service locator process. This process will uh, mm, we process <laughs> the announced services and it will register it in the service catalog. So from now, users can uh, see these services and they are able to request it. Yeah, so let's request for it. The request that said arrives to the request manager process that will start a new request stream because as you know we are we are longer so we love concurrency <laughs> so each request is handled by a separate process which is the so-called request stream process and it's it's uh, its word is definitely restricted to to the to only one request yeah after this uh, process has been started it's uh, we are be registered in the request catalog. So now you can see that there is a running request. What this request stream start uh, uh, will do as a first step is to ask the service locator process to resolve the user's request. Now the service locator process will return a, li um, a list of possible executors that may be able to execute the request, right? And the request stream is a bit of lazy process, so it won't do any real job. Instead, it will try to outsource uh, the request. So it first will ask the first implementation whether it wants to accept the request, and it will it will say that, uh oh, sorry, this is out of scope of my interest. It, it won't accept it. For instance, imagine that the request was to change um, Amnesia configuration parameter and the first implementation is, uh, yeah, is only dealing with uh, Mongoose IAM configurations. So, but the request stream process don't give up instead it turns to a second implementation and asks uh, to perform the request. The second implementation accepts the request and made a promise to execute this. So after this, uh, the request stream turns to be a real stream. This will be a, a direct channel between the user and between the implementation. And using this channel, uh, the, the users and the implementation can communicate with each other. They can send uh, commands, information, data using this stream. So assume that the implementation managed to, to do some job and it now returns some, uh, some data. And this, is, uh, this arrives to the request stream which will forward the data to the uh, user. Now, uh, imagine that one of your teammates arrives and, and he is interested in the same request that it's running at the moment. I have good news, your teammate do not need to see it next to you because users are allowed to attach to a running request. 
And after attaching to a running request, what will happen is that any further data that was pushed by the implementation will arrive to the, will be forwarded to both of the users. And how this um, story ends? Well, either uh, the users or the, or the implementation think that, okay, this is the end of the story, I want to terminate. And, this, this, and in this case, the request tree in process will die because it's performed its task, so it's ready. And of course, uh, with the termination of the request stream, the, the stream, the direct stream between the users and the implementation will terminate too. So uh, this was uh, the architecture in a nutshell. And now I, I asked Chava to show what we, what we did. Yeah, actually. so let's actually see how this looks like in Wombat. I I have a video about that, which is visible on my screen. <laughs> mm, I can try to make it full screen. Yeah, no, it's full screen on my screen. <laughs> it. Uh, yeah. I think I will set up mirroring. Now make it full screen. Great. So first, I will show you how uh, our ETOP integration works. So this is Wombat's web dashboard. Here we have one of the React nodes selected, which are managed by Wombat, and there you can see some of the services that you can <coughs> execute. So first, we select the ETOP service, and we select that we want to order the processes that are listed um, by their message queue length. So when I start the request, I will get this table, which contains the top processes ordered by message queue length. So you will see that the first process has uh, like more than 200 messages. And if I'd like to get more information about this process, that I can click on the ID and get info, messages, dictionary, state, and stack trace. So for example, the process messages will show you all the, not, not all the messages in the message queue, only the first 10 messages, because we, want to, we don't want to overload the node. And if you are wondering about what the process is doing right now, then you can have a look at the stack trace. So you can see that the process is doing a do put. And actually, it's doing a sleep, because we tinkered with it a little bit so that it will actually have that long queue. The second example is uh, visualizing ads tables. So it's quite similar to ETOP. Um, you say that you want to have a look at ads tables, and you will get a table with the tables. So each row here is an ads table, and by clicking on it, you can view what's inside the table. You can evaluate any Erlang or Elixir expressions here. So again, you select what you want to do. You type an expression which will say uh, what are the mm, connected, what are the nodes that are connected and like visible, and what are the nodes that are connected but hidden to this React node. And Wombat will simply execute it uh, and print the result, and you will be able to see that we are connected, of course, with the other React nodes in the cluster, and uh, Wombat itself is visible. Yeah, but uh, here we need to mention that uh, this is a bit of dangerous because yes. you, need, you, you know what you want to execute. Yes, so we integrated the chef knife as well, <laughs> <laughs> the dangerous part. Um, the good thing is that Wombat has like a user management, so you can say that yeah, this user knows what he's doing, so he's allowed to execute stuff like this, but the others are allowed only to execute at top and the other safe things. Yeah, and the last thing that I'd like to mention is configuration. So that was Vicky's example in the slide. So, well, in Erlang, we usually use configuration parameters to customize our nodes. So here, if I select the React node, and inside that, I select the application that I'm interested in, which is React KV in this case, 
then I will get a list of all the configuration parameters and their values. And that's it. Yeah, and, and here is a shameless plug that uh, to be, I think, yeah, yeah, within the next two weeks, uh, we'll give a talk about configuration management in, uh, in uh, Erlang workshop. So come join and enjoy it in Japan. <laughs> yeah, so now we... Yeah, do you have any questions? I hope you have. <laughs> yeah. Including, uh, so we are also waiting for suggestions about your favorite tools um, that you like, that like could be part of, of Wombat. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, can you get him the microphone? Oh, you, uh, yeah. Repeat the question also. Okay. So it can be recorded. Yeah. Dangerous services. Yeah, that's the end of the question. So <laughs> can you start again? Or yeah, can you start again? We couldn't hear. Ah, okay. So uh, my question is: Do you have kind of access management that some users cannot run certain services which yeah, are yeah, considered yeah, yeah. dangerous? Yes. Yeah, so that's what I mentioned, but I can elaborate on that. Um, so when you create a user in Wombat, you can decide whether he should have like a guest access, meaning that he like just can browse data and cannot do anything dangerous. He can be an admin, which means that he can even add nodes, or he can be in the middle, and there you can choose whether he has write access, uh, meaning he can do little changes, or even execute access, meaning that he can uh, run this executor, like change configuration and evaluate any long expression on the node. Yeah. Or uh, were you uh, worrying about uh, the overhead that we might we might put on the manage node, maybe. Ah, this is another question. Okay, good. So actually, uh, there are some um, services that that are a bit of resource consuming. So this is, for instance, Ctop, and uh, such. Uh, uh, such services are controlled by Wombat, uh, by the Wombat node, so there is an exclusivity um, constraint that we check. So if there is a running uh, ETOP request, then you are not allowed to start a new one, right? <coughs> Sorry. Can we see uh, like what's in the alarms, like the, what kind of alarms you receive, and and also the metrics, if we can. Okay, we can so see. Uh, can we see or not? Yeah. Uh, maybe I will. Uh, yeah, we see whether I have a warm bot running actually, because this was a video. <laughs> okay, ah, so. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do have a warm bot running. Well, <laughs> how lucky they! Yeah. <laughs> so these are a bunch of alarms. So for example, this alarm tells me that. Uh, my system, you know, it has a bunch of beam files, and there are beam files with the same name in different directories. And that might mean that you are having a problem. Okay. Yeah, so we have more than uh, 30 bit in alarms and more than 100 bit in metrics. Metrics are, can you show some metrics? Yeah. So metrics mm -hmm. are organized into three groups. So we have uh, let's say operation level metrics that measure the uh, the machine's um, attributes. We have Erlang VM level metrics. So for instance, the, what are you showing? Yeah, yeah total memory metric, process memory metric, yeah. So yeah. you can put up different kinds of memory metrics to see what the memory is used for. Yeah, and we have fine grain metrics. So for instance, you can check the, the um, the number of processes that are running at the moment, and and we have um, mm, we have collected metrics which have a history, and we also allow users to online debug system, and this is done by live metrics that are refreshed in each uh, second. Yeah, thank you. But uh, if you like to write your own plugin, then then you you can. Uh, 
push metrics, notification and alarms, and of course you can implement your own services, and all will be presented by this uh, web dashboard. Thanks. Any more question? Yeah, please. Okay, so in here I can see some metrics, but yeah. let's say that I already have like some sort of monitoring solution in place, let's say Graphite, for instance. Um, and I already like that one, so I don't want to replace that by this tool, Wombat, but I still wanna, wanna be able to get these metrics that you can get or that we could get with Wombat. Is it possible to forward them to Graphite or to get Graphite to consume this data? Yeah, absolutely. So we have uh, many integration possibilities. Around 10. Around 10, yeah. So we support pushing uh, data to Datadog, Graphite, Logstash, Graylog. Maybe you also page that Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. Great, that sounds pretty useful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> More questions? If not, that thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.